Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How to Make a Movie When You Don't Know Shit. And today, my guest is Mr. Lev Gorn. How you doing, What's buddy? Up? What's, What's up? up? <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Anytime. Anytime. Via your, uh, via your uh, spot in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, my hotel room. I, it's it, We're in West Hollywood at a place called the Chamberlain. And it's it's very nice. My home for like uh, 19 days this time around that we're here. You realize uh, that's how long it took us to make Last I Heard. 90, we made the film in, in 19 days. Get out of here. <laughs> Seriously, that's how? Yeah. That was the best like, time. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? So that before, was, we, before yeah. we get into the whole experience, because it was a great experience and you were so good in it, um, just uh, give, the, give the listeners a little background on you and what, because you do so many things. I mean, you're not actor, yeah. but there's all these other. Well, roles. you know, acting is definitely fun. Um, <laughs> um, it's, um, it's often a day job, but other times, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm also a writer director. Um, I'm a photographer. I do um, portraiture. I do headshots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist. I do fine art and I have stuff. I've had shows. I, I have interior designers that sell my artwork. Um, you know, I do a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff, and and I also get to the gym <laughs> <laughs> daily. Um, and um, I don't know what else. And what tell tell right? tell me about like so. Where did you grow up? So I was born in Russia, mm -hmm. right? I came here when I was very little. Um, so like do you remember my... anything about living there or were you too young to remember? Oh, I do. I mean, I went to three grades, so it was okay. still communist Russia. Wow. And, um, I know that, you know, we're Jewish, so our family was discriminated against in a, in a, in a fairly major way. You know, there's not there's not very much discrimination now toward Jews in Russia right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there is still a healthy amount, but for the most part, um, it was during Soviet Russia they discriminated uh, against Jews, and so a lot of Jews went to the United States in the seventies and the eighties, mm -hmm. um, and then again in the nineties and the two thousands. But the wave in the seven in, in the seventies and eighties was what they call the third wave, which was the biggest. And um, it's all, you know, think what you want about Reagan, but Reagan is the one that made it happen. He put a lot of pressure on the Soviets. So we came here. Um, I finished three grades. It was a fairly, you know, at, at that age, 10, 11 in Russia, the kids are much more mature. They're as mature as kids are who are 16 here wow. in the United States because of so much responsibility we had, you know, yeah. the education was very different. And, um, you know, and I came, we moved to Bensonhurst, you know, which was an Italian neighborhood. <laughs> and I was in like leather sandals and black nylon socks. And, you know, you know, all the kids are wearing their Pumas and, you know. You know wow. It, just, it was very. Culture shock. It was major culture shock. Major. Yeah. Not yeah. to mention I didn't really speak English. Wow. So learning English, new, new school, new friends, new life, new, friends, new, new, life. new country, new country. Um, I always feel like, I think that's how artists are made. I really do. I think it comes from, I mean, true artistry, I think comes from really having to adapt to something major, you know, some sort of, I mean, that's a lot of trauma. It's a lot of like, I mean, positive in a way, because you definitely, I'm sure, we're happy to leave behind what, what you and your family left behind to come here, but still major changes. I mean, I, I never looked at it that way, but I think that you're hundred percent right. Right. Because as an artist, you have to go through a certain amount of dark in order to be transformed. Right. right. And so that you can use those parts of you, those inner parts of you to work from mm -hmm. whether you're doing drama or comedy. Yes. Right? Yes. You're absolutely right. I mean, that was, it's traumatic leaving everything, you know, behind your yeah. friends, your whole world and moving to a different place. And I think like going into a, a new school, I mean, I'm someone that moved around a lot too. And I think having to go into a new school and make friends quickly is a skill set that is, is so valuable in life. It, it, it's like sucks 
for being a kid, but it really helps you as an adult because I know adults that don't know how to go into like a new situation and mm -hmm. they don't know what to do. They don't know how to make friends. They don't know how to, they just don't know how to, you know, and I feel like I just know how to do that because I've always had to do that. You know, it just becomes a skill. You know, I, I, I envy that skill. I don't know how good I am at that. I mean, maybe I am a little bit better than the average person, but mm. um, yeah, I mean, no, I guess I, I guess I have to do that all the time as an well, actor. Well, you must be as an actor. Every yeah. time you come on a new set, right? It's all new people and all You're new actually new right environment. About that. And some people like I, I've talked to normies like I'm, on my old podcast. I you know I interviewed some people that weren't in the business, and the thought of like basically we're we start a new job like sometimes three four ten times a year you know what yeah. I mean? we're starting a new job and some people like they go to a job and they never leave to me that's what's scary to go to a job and never leave like be at a company for 30 years <laughs> like i'd be i'd be but, looking out the window going three, can but i like, jump you know, like, but like all year long right nine to five like, yeah yeah like i've yeah. been on a series you know six seasons but right you take a nice healthy break from each other yeah after 12 episodes you know what <laughs> i mean <laughs> you need that hiatus to just like yeah, yeah regroup yeah, yeah no i'm talking about like nine to five same desk like you're sitting at yeah. the same desk nine to five you know i just don't know how people do that so so when did acting start for you what did you start young as a kid no um my grandfather was an artist um painter sculptor muralist and so at a very early age, I began to draw and my grandfather saw that I had talent and he took me under his wing and he began to formally teach me how to, how to draw and how to paint. So that and was your first, that was your first craft was, was artistry. Yes. Uh, yeah. fine, like fine art. I mean, I remember wow. in Russia, I'm eight years old and I'm in a professional studio with you know all these men and women just sketching charcoal of a nude in the middle of the room and there i am eight years old doing the same thing wow <laughs> you're kind of thrown into it and he was very intense my grandfather he was the most loving guy david but he but when it came down to the art he was he was extremely hardcore you know mm -hmm. i would fail i would fail every single assignment Wow. Just how we That's just <laughs> wow. Incredible. That's incredible. Incredible loving guy. He he actually it's because of him. We were we were not allowed to leave Russia because you had to apply. Mm -hmm. I had to wait two years for an answer. And my grandfather had as a bribe had done paintings and metalworks and murals for uh government officials like that were high up that mm -hmm. were that, that eventually had pushed our paperwork through so that we could be allowed to leave wow so if it was not for him if it was not for him we may have never never left and that's wow that's the truth you know and he was incredible in walking into a room and just all of a sudden becoming people's friends and i remember mm -hmm. my father who said to him he was he was my mother's father, my grandfather. The, the pain. My, my, one time, I remember my father said to him, D -D "David, what do you say when you walk into a room full of these officials?" And he says, "Well, I say hello. Uh, my name is David, <laughs> and um, I'm an artist. Wow. And that's and that's what it, he was just always like that. You know, that's great. That's great. That's that ability that we were talking about to do that. So." Yeah. So from there, so when did when did acting become something you were interested in or thought about or? I was never into it. I went to uh, I was into art, into you know, yeah. and it's like I was like, yeah, acting is just kind of I don't know, you know, it's not that manly, you know. It's just mm -hmm. I like to draw and paint, you know, and uh, then in college. I had discovered photography and I was, you know, hanging out with my black and white camera. Anyway, I was studying history and literature. I was going to be a professor mm -hmm. of history and or mm -hmm. literature together. Mm -hmm. and I went to study abroad I went to grad school. I was going to be, I was going to get my PhD. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I was studying in Swansea, Wales, in the UK, and I met a girl, as one does, and she was an actress. There was a play, there were auditions, and she said, "Is it? Am I allowed to say this? I'm not going to curse. You can so curse. You can, I can curse. You can snip this out." She yeah. said, "If you want to get into my pants, you got to audition." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, what?" He's like, "Yeah," and it was. A man for all seasons, a Robert Bolt play. Like, yeah, you know, uh, I had to audition for Henry the Eighth, and so I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So I, I don't remember what it was. I auditioned. I was just like, I was like, yes, you know. <laughs> and then I didn't see her. And like the next day, there was a list. I didn't know about it. Like I was right. doing my thing, whatever it was. And then somebody said, "Love," and back then they called me Leo. Like Leo you're going to be in the play. And I was like, wait, what, what play? What are you talking about? I was, Yesterday you auditioned. I was, oh, I, I, wait, what? He goes, you got the part. You're going to be playing young Henry VIII. Wow. I felt nausea all <laughs> my body, nausea, like, like a panic attack. And eventually oh. when I'm doing the play and it takes, the play is really about Sir Thomas More and Henry VIII. And, you know, Henry VIII was wild. He wanted to, he had lots of wives. He beheaded right. them all. He broke right. with the Catholic church. And Sir right. Thomas More was ultra Catholic. <laughs> and he was his right-hand man, Henry VIII, right-hand man. And they were also best friends. Mm -hmm. and so he needed Sir Thomas More to put a stamp of approval for the country, for everyone, that it's okay to divorce and to separate yeah. the church and to create a church of England. And so I had scenes. And so ultimately, Sir Thomas More said no because of his beliefs. And he had his head cut off. Henry wow. the and so I had scenes where I would say, Sir, I was from Brooklyn. Sir Thomas More, it is your duty to put your stamp on this document. <laughs> and the director was like, Lev, duty. And I was like, duty, duty, duty. You know, <laughs> and so ultimately, you know. Oh my God, this is amazing. That's, it was, but after that. was that, your intro. That was my intro after that. And I felt like throwing up every single time I had to go on stage. Wow. Well, it's and funny. Too. I remember even like when we were working together, I remember you've always sort of had like a, um, acting was never to me, my impression of you is not something that you were ever chasing or ever like, you know, like full on, like, this is my thing. You always had other things. Well, yeah. Uh, but at the time that you met me, I had actually quit acting for good. Mm. And I had not done anything for three years. Paul Ben Victor called me. I had not spoken to him for quite a while. Mm -hmm. so close. I had directed a couple of short films before that that did really well and he was in them. Mm -hmm. And he called me and he said, you owe me one, you gotta do this movie. I was like, what movie? And he told me about the movie. I was like, bro, this, I have to play an Italian. Mm -hmm. Bro, look, there are Italian actors in this town who will pay you to be in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Cast them. He's like, no, Dave, the wonderful late Dave Rodriguez. No, Dave wants you. I'm like, that's really sweet, but I'm not doing this. I don't act anymore. I quit. I'm a photographer. I'm an artist now. That's it. That's all I do. And he said, no, 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 you owe me. You got to do this. So anyway, he browbeat me into it. And then we had to rehearse. He was like, okay, now I'm going to play Dave and you're going to be you. Hey, Lev, I, want, I got this role for you in this movie. I'm like, cool. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 no. That's not what an actor does. No, no, no. You have to be excited. Yeah, I'm going to give you a line read. Cool. Awesome. I can't wait to do it. And so we had to do this. The only actor in the world that's like, really? You're giving me work? I got an offer? Ugh. But then ultimately, it was like really an incredible experience. And I made oh, so many so fun. Yeah. Yeah, it so was made me go back to acting. Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't, yeah. I remember, I remember hanging out, I think we were hanging out in the makeup chairs or something. And remember you saying to me like, 
what's the thing that like, what's the part like where you go all the time and you're on, I go like a series regular. You're like, yeah, it's not, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be there like all the time. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> who is this actor that doesn't want <laughs> the best job in acting? He wants just like, I want to show up once in a while, do, you know? Um, so I didn't know that I, first of all, I didn't know that you had been out. And then I definitely didn't know that that was what brought you back in. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit about Last I Heard. Um, so, so the film used to be called Last I Heard. I'm sure that was the first script that you got. So how I got involved, and I've talked about this on a couple of podcasts, was my dad, who's an actor who did one of the podcasts, actually the first podcast, um, he did a stage reading of um, this thing called Last I Heard. And I got really, I was just fascinated by the story. And I was at that time pursuing acting in, in LA. And I, and I was like, I really, Kathy Narducci was who read the role when I went to the stage reading. P, uh, Paul Ben Victor, who you talked about, PVV was in it. Um, Johnny Rose Beef, I think was doing a different part. My dad, there was a lot of different actors, but Kathy Narducci was the main character. So in my head, I thought that's who was going to play it because I was like, that's the role I would love to play the daughter, you know? And, um, anyway, so we went up to Paul Ben Victor's house for New Year's Eve. I started talking to Dave and, and that was how it all kind of came to be. So when we were in New York, originally, like I said, I had planned on just being just acting in it you know I if I'm being honest like I always thought at some point in my career I would direct I would produce I would because I was a writer as well I'd already written a screenplay and, and a couple of pilots and stuff so I just thought yeah at some point I'll produce and yeah so some point that will happen um but I just sort of got literally got thrown on the spot like it was like okay today you start producing <laughs> So it was, it was kind of, and I was in, a, I mean, I didn't have a huge part, but I was in a lot of scenes because I played Michael's wife. So pretty much when Michael was there, I was there. So producing and being in a lot of scenes is, is challenging. Um, and I really loved being behind the monitor and watching the work. So the day your big scene, the, your big scene, I was not in. Um, so I remember that day at the deli, you know, that like major scene and, um, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know that you weren't Italian. I didn't know that that wasn't your, you know what I mean? I, just, I didn't know anything. I just knew you, I knew you had to be really strong because you were going, you're, you know, you're the, you're the villain. I the antagonist. It. Yeah. I, I was, I was very nervous to do it because I had not worked in three years. I mean, I, I was always confident in my work. Uh, but I was also respectful of, of the fact that um, of putting in the time, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. just having come from a, the background of being an artist, I have a tremendous amount of respect for it. And that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to take the role because I'm like, look, there are people who are killing themselves every day trying to get three lines, you know, and you're just offering mm -hmm. me this part. Anyway, I'm, I mean, I, I'm super glad that I did it because I met all these wonderful people and, you know, I met you and I met Dave and well, I actually knew Dave before that, but we got closer. And so it, yeah. was, it really was a great experience and it and it showed me the possibility of going, OK, well, I could actually do this. I, I you know, what I did is I, I called my agent afterwards and who had called me for three years straight with auditions. And I said, don't call me anymore. Don't ever call, <laughs> stop calling me. And she's like, oh, you're having a bad day. That's fine. I'll call you with another. And so when I called her, wow. I said, it was, it was, she was just, she was slightly out of her mind, Renee, but she's a, was a very good agent. Um, she, I said to her, Renee, I'm going to get back in because uh, it's fun. And also all I got to make, what, 20, 25, 30 grand a year just to have that health insurance. And that's easy to do that on the side. You know, I do that when I'm not, you know, have my real jobs, you know. Right. And uh, and she said, OK, but are you going to be an asshole? And I said, I said, I, Renee, I don't think that's like separate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think that just is. And she said, oh, okay. that's great. And, you know, shortly after that, I got the Americans and I said, wow. That kind of changed my whole trajectory in terms of being an actor. 
do you do you think that um was it the roles you had done prior were they i guess what i'm saying is there is there a correlation to the role that you play dominic in last i heard to getting the role in the americans was there something in that character that was That's, similar or well one of the reasons why i had quit acting is because i was being cast in <clears throat> almost solely these these like tough guy russian parts mm -hmm. and and i said to myself i'm gonna quit on a high note and so i waited mm -hmm. till i got a really great role it was a russian but it was on a, it was on a show called bored to death mm -hmm. jonathan ames with uh, jason schwartz and uh, ted danson and it was a, a phenomenal experience it was a really complex interesting role it was funny and mm -hmm. you know i'm pretty good at comedy and after that i quit because i felt good i felt like i went out on a high note and so when this came around and you know for me to play an italian i grew up there yeah you know wasn't very difficult for me to do you know right um, growing up in bensonhurst i'm sure there was definitely these kinds of guys around right there were my whole block was full of right. a lot of and dominics a lot and i had a lot of italian yeah. friends and it's just it's just it's normal for me to talk like this this is just how i talk for the whole you know first half of my life like this how you right. doing you know, because yeah. that's how I talked, you know, until yeah. I had to take acting classes and, you know, and they said, okay, Same. you talk like this, you know, you've got to, right, you know how it is. Yep. Um, and so that kind of opened up my mind. I said, okay, I could go and read for some stuff. And at that point, I was like, I don't give a shit whether it's Russians or whatever, because I can have good health insurance. For some reason, I needed good health insurance. I don't know why. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> I know why. I know why. I know why. Because prior to that, I, I had I had been hired uh, on a big uh, shoot for a magazine, mm -hmm. and um, and I remember being pissed off or something. This was the day before the shoot. I was pissed off and I was a little hot headed back then, and I punched a wall mm. and I broke my hand, and I had no health insurance. Ugh, and that's the worst. I was I was young. I was crazy, and so I went to the. I went to emergency room and they said, we're not going to, it's, it's, it's considered elective surgery. We can't fix it. Oh man. So the next day I did the shoot wrapped up in a, like an air cast. Oh my gosh. Percocets. Oh my and I God. Shoot. And after that, you know, I had to borrow some money or whatever it is yeah. and go and get pins. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So that was my consideration. Okay, I can get good health insurance. That's what it was, you know? <laughs> I think there's something, it's funny, there's there's something energetically, you know, about, you know, I, I think for me, I always wanted to be an actor since I was little, I grew up around it. It was in my family. Actually, that's not true. First, I wanted to be a singer. I sang for years and I had a band sure. and was on the road and all that. So first it was singing, but, um, but there was always sort of like i'll sing then i'll act kind of thing and then the acting came but i think energetically there's something about when you're not chasing it that it starts to flow you know and i and i think like when i look back on any jobs i booked it was usually jobs i went in with a different kind of an attitude a different kind of an energy you know where it's just sort of like okay i'm gonna go in and do this and i'm not gonna you know, I'm just going to make it about, I'm just going to give a good audition. I'm not going to worry about like the job, you know, the ones that I went, seems like the auditions that I went in for, where I was like, this is my, like, I got it. What, what, why would I not get this? It just never worked out. So I think I just had to, you know, but, but, but there's something about energetically. I think the fact that you were involved in other things and it, what, you know what I'm saying? And it was just, it kind of came organically that I think it was just, it's almost like the floodgates just kind of opened and then opportunities just started coming your way. I, you know, I think, I think that's, I, I also, I agree with you with that. I also believe I have this saying that I have, I, I read a lot of, you know, historical literature and there's a saying that the Vikings used to say, mm. um, but the Saxons are the ones who, who created, but the, this, the Vikings, is to say this saying, and it's it's right here, tattoo. Oh wow! Right here, and it says "vir bit which means 
destiny is all but inexorable or destiny's it's unstoppable it's there mm. and i i really think it was i really think it's my destiny yeah to, because it just it came to me i didn't yeah you didn't I chase it much yeah yeah i i i love that i love that that that's sort of like your like your motto like your mantra and everything that's on your arm because i think that is true and i think it's a lot of clearing out of the way all the other noise and stuff to get to like what is true purpose and all that because it's it's interesting when you said before we started like wow you know that was the first time you produced and you're really good at it it was like when i sat there the first time in that chair like watching the monitor i realized like everything that i had done up to that point sort of led to this you know because I was a PA, I was a stand in and it's like those jobs are really hard jobs, you know, but I was like, it's a PA, I was a stand in, I was, you know, uh, a mother, I mean, I think honestly, being a mother, and I've always been a reader since I was a little, little girl, I mean, I've always like I read way above my grade grade level. My my parents were always like, wait, why are you getting those books? Like I loved stories. I just love stories. And so sitting in that chair, I realized like all this is is I'm watching a visual story. And so anytime part of that story didn't make sense to me was when I like interjected. You know, I, I kind of Dave, I mean Dave ran a great set. He was a great director and I think he cast everybody so brilliantly that yeah. All we had to do was just be us. All yeah, we had to do was just yeah. bring what we bring, you know, and um, and and I think he also cast people that really understood story, you yeah. know. Yeah. We were we were all telling our own story in a way. And you know, I think that's so true with Dominic because the first time you come in, first time your character comes in, what I loved about it is like right away I kind of got everything that that you were i got the neighborhood i got the background i got the um the relationship between you and michael you know and uh it, yeah and it was yeah it was it was really interesting but um i guess what i what my point was with that is that um as a producer one of the things i learned is that you know all i had to do was just make sure the, the story make sure the story was being told and when i felt like it wasn't or something wasn't going to pay off in the end. Like one of the things that I did speak up about was the, when you hit Renee, uh -huh. later on, they didn't have her face really showing like that she was really knocked out. And so right. that was something that I, I sort of fought for, which was, you know, I knew where Mr. Joe's character was gonna go, like, uh -huh. you know, and if he was gonna go there, like we had to, Needed we to had have a real bruise, right? Yeah, we had we had a root. That's for what that, a good so. producer does. This is exactly my, this is my pet peeve with with films, especially indie movies. It's mm -hmm. little moments like that that you did not let go. Like it's when you cut a little corner like that, you get smacked in the face, and there is nothing on the face, right? Or somebody cries, but they're not really crying. They're just mm -hmm. acting. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Tiny little things or like wardrobe that's just you just bought it. It's not it doesn't look real. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like um stuff that's tiny little things when you which I call cutting corners, but accumulation of that turns into mediocrity. And you yeah. go, Wait, why? This is a good script, and it was like a pretty good cast. And then yeah, it's when you just cut those little corners. I'm so glad that you told me about that. I had no idea about that because that's a crucial moment. Yeah, it wouldn't have paid off in the end. And it was a, it was sort of a scary position for me to put my foot down on, but you know, it was funny because Paul Servino had my back. So it was like, I felt a little bit more like, you know, uh, he had brought it up and I was like, wait a minute, no, we had, you know, and, and I don't know what the thought process was or, you know, not to call anybody out, but there were people that were fighting for her not being bruised. And, um, and I just knew that he, I mean, I knew that I knew that he was going to commit a murder. And I knew that in order for him to 
I don't want to say be justified, but in order for that to play out the way it needed to play out, you just had to, every, the whole audience had to be upset. And there's something about, <clears throat> and it doesn't matter the culture. I think any culture, a father and a child, you know, especially a father and a daughter, you know, somebody does something to your kids, you know, you, there's a level that you reach, you know what I mean? People will do anything for their kids. And especially if the father is who he is, who he, who he is. is, right, Absolutely. right, right. He's killed for less, so this is going to be exactly for so sure. Different? But you yeah. have to show it. Don't yeah. So a couple of things I want to talk about with you, and I also want to get to your screenplay. So I want to talk about um, your so your first scene in the movie. So your scene in the movie where you come into the deli. Had you worked, I mean, aside from, from Paul Ben Victor, had you worked with the other actors before? No, um, I didn't know anyone other than Paul. Okay. okay. And I was, I was very, very nervous because um, Michael Rappaport had to be, at that point, probably one of my most famous, uh, most favorite actors. And I, admire him yeah Still, you know and at that time at that time even more so and i had been out of practice for three years so i paul was coaching me paul was, <laughs> I was working with paul and um and we we're working on the scene um i think that it turned out to be really well yeah it, it turned out pretty good you it know? came out great it came out great and i had the same experience because my first scene was with michael too and I was the same as you, you know, I was a big fan. And so it is, yeah. it is intimidating. Yeah. And I think people don't talk about that enough, you know, as actors, it's like you get on set and all of a sudden, I mean, the first time I ever acted in a film was with Sharon Stone. And it was just like, you know, you're just like, okay, go, you know, <laughs> you're like, what? This fucking Sharon Stone. <laughs> yeah, what, do you Sharon mean, Stone. Like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> you're like Sharon Stone. <laughs> And I had just seen like basic instinct, you know, I was like, I mean, I was like, wow, you know, so it is, it is hard, you know, and, um, and yeah, and, and Michael's great. And Michael just, Michael made it really easy. I mean, it was funny. It was just like, it, I remember Paul Ben Victor, it, it's like these little compliments that other actors give you that you just like, for me, and I'm sure I don't want to speak for you, but I know for me, like those are the ones that just are the like the closest to my heart. And Paul Van Victor was like, I just buy you guys as a married couple. He's like, you just, your relationship with Michael, just little things that you did. Like there's one scene where he's eating and I bring him a napkin. It's just like- I remember totally, that. I remember yeah. things like that. Or I, I remember <laughs> that. I remember that. But it was hard, but I was very intimidated just having to, you know, I'm like, I mean, he's, he's acted with great actresses, award-winning Academy Award. Then it's just like, now I'm going to play his wife. It's like, whoa, you know, like, it was You know intense. what? Like, like to me, it read like those relationships where like, they still have, they're still hot for each other. Yeah. Not that's what I wanted it to be. Yeah. yeah. Like, like a good still, marriage. Yeah. 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 They're still hot for each other and they really into each other. And, and I think part of and I think part of it was like, I, I made the choice to like challenge him to, you know, to be there for him. And like, I'm the dutiful wife and the whole bit, but like to also be the wife that's sort of like in it a little bit, you know? Yeah. So the first scene where we did, where I was just like, tell her that thing that you heard, you know, got, got, like I was like, and, um, and our first, our first scene was the funeral. And it wasn't the first scene. The first scene was the deli, but the first, like where we really had a lot of interaction was the funeral. And you know, he's a comic and I'm a comic and we just, I mean, it was funny. I mean, we were just like, la I think Dave and my husband were so fed up with us because we were just cracking, like back and forth, like, we just <laughs> hysterical laughing. Like at one point, the, the, I guess the sound guy had like a, a my mic, but you could see it. And <laughs> Dave was like, the fuck is my wife wearing a wire like what what are you doing like what and we were just like just cracking up just like kids in high school <laughs> like back and forth um but yeah no that's that's a big deal right you go in and you're like here you are and and it's the day and and just you're acting it. and and your scene with him was very it, it was volatile i mean it was a a fight 
Yeah, it was. It, it, I mean, I yeah, it was. I wanted to really, I wanted to bring it hard to him. You know, mm -hmm. I I have. I often think about like where I see actors. I've not, I've, at this point, I've had a lot of experience working with what you call stars, right? Or, you mm -hmm. know, people who are really, you know, so famous. And, um, and I see actors making soft choices because they're working working with stars mm. you see what I'm saying? yeah the choices they're making are based on their relationship their personal relationship and i always go to myself you got to go hard whatever that relationship is whether it's a loving relationship whether it's a contentious relationship you've got to go all out hard especially with someone who is on that level first of all you're going to get so much more mm-hmm so much, uh, so much more of a relationship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and my thing is I never talk to them before we, it's always like, well, uh, love, this is so-and-so I'm like, yeah, great. You know, I don't <laughs> say, yeah, great. But I say, okay, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm not into chatty, chatty. Once mm -hmm. we get, once we break the ice, once we have a real scene, you know, I remember I was doing Madam Secretary with Taglioni and I was playing the president of Ukraine and she was like, you know, the secretary of state and she was getting me to do something and I, and I was fighting against it. And, and I was just, before we would start, I would get myself going by just talking to her. I'm like, where I would say, no, I'm not doing this. You know, like, mm -hmm. I don't care what you Americans say, this is bullshit, you know, set, you know, rolling, you know, camera, you know, action and sounds, and she was, she, she really respected that because, mm. because it wasn't like chatty, 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 and then get into a conversation, then, right. then the scene. So to bring it back to Michael, is like, I knew Michael is a badass actor in every way, serious. Mm -hmm. comedy, yeah. And I everything. wanted to bring it really hard on him. Mm -hmm. It worked out, you know. Plus it, it did work out. It did work out. And it's such it's such a great scene. And um, listen, I could talk to you all day. We could go into acting, we could go into writing, we could go to a million things, but I want to talk a little bit about your project that uh that I read, which was just incredible. And uh just tell me a little bit about well you know, this when, when, well yeah for you for your listeners and viewers, this is the first yeah, I know you read it, but this is the first time I'm actually hearing your impression on it. Yeah. Other than that yeah. you said you like I made you wait. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the release um, right um, it's always best when you have to wait yeah i know it's the best <laughs> it, it it's a it's a pretty well why don't you give me well, first of all here's here's what i'll say you know um i was really blown away by the story i mean it's so well written i mean obviously the dialogue is so strong the characters are incredible. I mean, just, and this, and this story is like, where did you, how did this even come about? I was, I was really blown away. And, and you said to me something that I will tell you, a lot of people say, they'll say, oh, once you start reading it, you won't be able to put it down. And I really wasn't, wasn't able to put it down. I thought I would read it in chunks. And I was like at the pool sweating, going, what's happening next? Um, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's very character driven, but it's also very event driven because there's so much that happens and I don't want to give things away. So I, I, I'm saying very little about the plot and the story, but I would love to hear uh, so, your exposure and, and, and where this, how this came about. Well, I, I, first of all, thank you for reading it that, you know, um, of course. I, I don't ever send it to anyone who I know may or may not read it. I only send it when I know someone's going to read it. I knew you were going to read right. it because uh, that's what you said. And my experience of you is that you do what you say. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And I had this idea. I, I saw this documentary many, many years ago, maybe 10 years ago. 
uh, this documentary called um, The Devil's Playground. And it's about an event in, in Amish culture called Rumspringen, where teenagers at 16 are allowed to leave the community and experience the world as they show it outside mm -hmm. of community so they can mm -hmm. you know, drive cars they they you know a lot of them you know go to parties they drink they, they experience with drugs not not that that is condoned but it's certainly not right. condoned. you know they're they're supposed to make because in the amish culture they don't get baptized at birth they get baptized only when they choose to join the church which is usually in their late teens early 20s and interesting yeah so that's why they are supposed to experience the world so that they know that they are when they join the church and get baptized, they're committing to that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I, and, and it's, uh, an idea came to me, which for about 10 years I lived with until the pandemic hit and I was losing my mind. So I wrote this thing and I had written the script before with a partner who was not a great guy, great writer, just, but he wasn't really interested in writing this particular thing with me, mm -hmm. you know? So, and it just worked out perfectly. And, um, so it's basically it, the story is 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 about uh, a, a guy who who survives uh, a multiple murder related to drugs mm -hmm. uh, as he's a teenager. All of his friends and part of his family die, and then over the next twenty years, he becomes a family man. Uh, he runs a farm. He's Amish. He's an Amish guy, and he becomes a preacher. And a twist of fate brings him and the murderer face to face 20 years later. It's so incredible. And what's always interesting to me is how religious morality um, challenges human nature. And, you know, I, I had had a lot of experience. I, I'm Jewish and I went to, you know, yeshiva, which is a, a Jewish school. And there's been a lot of time in my life where I was face to face with religion. I've studied religions throughout my whole life. And it's always interesting to me how religion creates a binary world, mm -hmm. um, which and allows for almost no gray area at all. Whereas in my experience, the world really arises. 95% of the world lives in the gray area and the extremes. Right are you know life and death right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that's really what i was interested in and in, in exploring human nature and uh, and religious morality and, and also i was interested in um, um just exploring just these worlds colliding different worlds different cultures uh, and with and with the amish culture i mean how did you write about I mean, how did you write so well <laughs> what it, what it's like to be Amish? Well, I, I did a bunch of research and then I wound up becoming friends with some of them. And then eventually I was invited and I lived on an Amish farm and I lived with the Amish and um, it was an extraordinary experience, a very spiritual experience. Wow. Uh, also, an extreme experience in that, you know, Amish go to school up until the eighth grade. Right. And they're not allowed to go to school after that because it's considered prideful. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Higher learning is considered not good. So if wow. you can imagine the teachers in their, you know, one room schoolhouses, they haven't gone past the eighth grade. Eight grades. And they haven't gone past the eighth grade. Is that right? Yeah, eighth grade education. So you've basically got a high school graduate. No, you've got a grammar school graduate. Junior high school, like not even a junior high school, like, like right. middle school. Middle and, school uh, teacher teaching. Wow. And, you know, and here's the thing. The other side of it is because in the 70s, they were taken to court by, I think, by the federal government because mm. it was considered like some kind of abuse and they mm. got themselves a really good jewish lawyer actually the amish and they fought it on uh on they fought it on statistics which is how many unemployed 
um, Amish are, how many Amish are in relationship percentages, right? Are there in prisons? How much crime there are in, in the Amish communities? Wow, and, that's interesting, like, huh? Uh, how many, um, you know, tr- you know, uh, kids that create trouble in the communities? And it was like, you know, 1%, 2%, 1%, you know, 3%. Yeah. And, um, and so the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Amish. They said Unbelievable. That, that could be a whole movie right there. I know. It's fascinating, but, you know. It's not alone. It's, it's a fascinating thing. And, um, but anyway, so I don't, I don't know how we got on the whole eighth grade thing. Well, I was asking I how, yeah. I lived yeah, with you them. You lived with the Amish. You know, I had dinner with them. I ate with them. And, you know, if, if you're asking someone, um, how's the weather? That's not small talk because your life is around the farm. So weather is everything. Yeah. So, th- so what you think is small talk, it's actually very deadly serious. And one other thing wow. that I have found, the Amish are extraordinarily funny. They're really? jokes. That's they're something behind. you wouldn't know, right? They're ribbing each other all the time. But, <laughs> and a lot of these jokes are all kind of like Bible centered. Because they know that left and right, right. everybody. They know that world, that. right? One of my favorite jokes, which is in the script, um, is, um, oh yeah, you know, um, you know, John Miller here. You know, he he, he doesn't. You know, we sent him over to, to to the seminary. You know, because he didn't know anything. You know, he wanted to be a preacher. He didn't know anything, and and they said to him. Um, what did they say? They said, to him, oh, they said, where is Jesus from? And he said, uh, what did he say? He said, Kansas. Do you remember this joke that I wrote? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Like Kansas. And he was like, no, he's not. He's from Bethlehem. He goes, I knew he was from Philadelphia. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> so, great. Yeah. Uh, so that was a cool experience. And then there was a whole prison narrative. And I spent a lot of time hanging out with um, former inmates and, um, traveled quite a bit and during COVID it was challenging, you know, but. Yeah. So that's when you were writing, this was during COVID. Yeah. During the pandemic. I mean, you really did your research. I mean, that, that, that's the part that really shows because I mean, these are, these are intense, intense worlds, two completely different worlds. I mean, I don't want to say completely different, but two different, two, two worlds, you know, the prison being locked up in the prison system and in some ways being locked up in an Amish community or culture. So it's like two people that are kind of trapped and then all of those parallels coming Mm -hmm. together, you know, is just, is just mind blowing. And um, I know, uh, I know you have an an appointment and somewhere to be, like I said, I could talk to you forever, but what, uh, what do you want to say about this project? What, I know you have some hopes around where this is, uh, where you see this going. Well, so I, I it's a full I've length feature through, film. It's a full length feature film. I've been lucky so far in that I've I've gotten some really great professional um heat around it. I got signed with a lit agent. Um and you know, ultimately now I'm looking for um you know, I'm doing a lot of meetings and I'm looking for a producer mm-hmm. to take it to I, I think I think I wouldn't if I it doesn't it's not a, I don't think it's a low budget film. I mean I I'm no. a low budget film, you know. It's no. I would yeah. say it's a lot going on. Yeah. 10 to 20, you know, but right. um, if you get a really strong cast and you partner up with a good studio, like an A24 or, you know, or killer films or, you know, a, um, something, you know, focus pictures. I personally think that this type of film would do extremely well in the European market. I mean, definitely domestic. For sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But this is the type Especially. of film that, you know, yeah that I could see standing on the red carpet at, you know, at Cannes or, um, you know, Venice, Venice Berlin. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you, I mean, these roles, these two male roles, I mean, these are just dream acting roles because there's so much. The, well, it's yeah. And they age over the course of 20 years. And I think that's a cool, a challenging experience. And there's actually, you know, sure. there's a third role, Bob. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Kind of, it's it's kind of you have three men who 
who, as a result of this traumatic experience, um, have different trajectories mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. And then the three of them smash together 20 years later. Yeah. You know? And so you have a guy named Bob, who's African-American, he's, he's older, you know, I could see like, um, um, you know, like a Lawrence Fishburne or, mm -hmm. uh, or someone, someone of that, someone of that stat stature. Caliber, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. That caliber. Uh, and, you know, the main Amish guy, something, somebody like a, a McAvoy, James McAvoy, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the killer who, who also transforms and finds, yes. finds God. Um, you know, somebody like, um, like a Jimmy Smith's. Um, yeah. You know, kind of really, you know, I, it, it, it's a diverse cast, not for the sake of diversity. Right. Which is what's right. kind of sort of in now. It's a diverse yeah. cast because of the need. Yeah. And, and if you think of these three characters are the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, that's sort of mm. the, that's the sort of the, the archetype, mm. you know, who's the beginning, who's yeah. the, end, the middle, you know? And then will you, will you act in it? Is there a part that you feel you'd want to do or, or is this I not? No, I mean, there's this one gangster in it, you know, uh, Indian Mike, who's got like a Mohawk. Right. Um, I would love to, I, I would, I would love to play it, but my father yeah. said, you're not right for it. You're not right. No. No, no, you're not right for it. You know, I was like, okay. Sounds like you have the father that I have, that honest, know. you know, it's just like, <laughs> that's not, not for you. That's not for you. Um, but would you want to, you're going to direct it? I am. I'm going to direct it. Uh, right. I'm going to stay out of it in terms of uh, casting, unless I need to, you know, jump in and play a smaller part. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to focus 100% on the directing of it. In the directing uh, world. Absolutely. You know, I All mean, right. for, for me, it's not just directing for me, it's the entire vision. You know, yeah. I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, I'm an actor, yeah. I'm a writer. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's all of it. It's not like I just show up and say, okay, here's where the camera goes. Every element for is sure. for me, especially for this film, you know? Yeah, no. And, and that's, yeah. And I mean, I think there's different types of directors, but I, I love when the director has that kind of, a, and I think when you're the writer, you know, it's just like what we, did with last I heard, you know, Dave had some very specific ways and and stuff that he, how he saw it going because because he wrote it. So when you write it and direct it, it's almost like your vision, you know, you're directing your own vision the way that you mm -hmm. saw it. I, I think it's it's interesting that with that as directors, you know, I mean, I guess you read a script and you have your own ideas and then you direct what what you see. But yeah. um, but it's interesting from a writer director perspective that is like the most creative experience because you I mean from 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 day one when you started writing yeah. this yeah. to seeing it go to the full screen anyway like I said I could talk to you forever um, but uh, so thank you so much for doing this and um, such a pleasure to get to know you on last I heard and uh, and good to reconnect and. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just, I wish you the best with it. I was really riveted by every aspect of it. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to see it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I want to see it for sure. Um, so good to see you. Same, same. And um, I'll be in LA and I'll see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go eat some Italian food. Go stuff okay. our faces. All right. <laughs> cool. Good to see you. Bye, honey. <laughs>